can you hear me well? Everyone? Awesome. Yeah. So, Matthew, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm so happy to see so many young faces in the audience uh, because it's inspiring to see students because uh, as Matthew say, what we are doing right now is going to be very important for them, especially for them because they could be part of this program. So here I, I'm going to discuss and I'm going to present to you space weather and space radiation for future man admission to the moon and Mars. So this is the world as we know it. If we know many things in our world, in our planet, but it was not always like that. So just to give you an idea, this is a world map from more or less 1600 ago. So not that long time ago, we can find trees that they have this age, right? So if you look at this map, you can barely recognize where Italy is. So it's somewhere up here, but it's very complicated. This was our vision of the world in 1482. So before discovering and before finding uh, Americas and before discovering many other territories. So the human desire for exploration since always led to discovery. And it's thanks to these explorers, and here I just give you a list of them that you might know, Cristoforo Colombo, but also Vasco de Gama, Magellano, some of James Cook, Marco Polo, some of them that you have already studied, some, some others that you might just know of. So it's thanks to them that we know now the world, uh, that it, what we know of the world is thanks to them. So at that time, the ancient explorer used the stars to navigate. So already there, you can see how important was to get inspiration using the stars. And some of the ancient population that you were the first to use the stars to navigate were the Polynesians. The Polynesians not only use the stars, but they use it also other things like the weather, the, the movement of the of the sea and also the migration of the birds, but it were, they were the first one to use the stars. And indeed, following the Ukulea star, they believed that uh, uh, af after every brightest stars indicated the position of an island. And so following the Ukulea, they were able to find our beautiful island of Hawaii, where they were inhabited uh, until around 400 or 500 after Christ. So you see how many new territories these explorers can bring to us. And as ancient Polynesian and other explorers um, were considered um, explorers at that time and they bring new knowledge, astronauts are considered explorers of this, uh, of this time. So it's important what they do because they bring knowledge to all of us. They um, increase our knowledge of the world, of our planet, and of the universe. So the first man that went in space was in 1961 and was Yuri Gagarin. And he was a Russian guy. You see his picture here. He went in all the newspaper at that time, and he did something really incredible. And after him, there were all the Apollo missions. The first one, Apollo 11, which is indicated here, which started in 1969, with the first man that landed on the moon from the US. So we know that this thing was, uh, was something amazing, something amazing that happened again with the Apollo 12, with the Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17. But after that, we never had again the opportunity to go to the moon. So here you see one of the Apollo mission, Apollo 15, where they already brought some, you see here, they have a sort of car in the moon and they already made many, many discoveries by then. So, but since then our focus moved to something different. It was like, okay, we are able to go to the moon, but are we able to live in space? So it's at that time that we started to build the International Space Station. So 
now in November, last November was 20 years of the International Space Station. You have to imagine that the, this uh, station is big like a football field. So it's very, very big and is uh, all powered by solar panels. And sometimes we have to give a boost to bring it up because otherwise it will get down <laughs> towards our planet. And here we were able to see that human can live in space for more than a year, monitor from Earth. So also this improved our knowledge of microgravity, how to survive in space, and how are different the conditions from this planet to being in space. So we were able to isolate, isolate um, scientific phenomena, excluding gravity from the, from the equations. So we improved lots of knowledge of the human body, of um, biology, but also how is life in space and also so lots of technological constraints were learned and were overcome. So if we look at the future, what do we see? As Matthew was saying, we want to plan what is called the Artemis program. The Artemis program is taking its name Artemis because uh, you know we, we already send men on the moon. We never send women on the moon. So we want to, Artemis was um, the twin sister of Apollo. So it's a female. And uh, also uh, in the Greek mythology, she's also the, the goddess of the moon. So this is the best name that we could find, I, I guess. And um, the idea is to send the first woman and uh, together with a man, of course, to the moon by 2024 to develop a sustainable human presence of the moon by 2028. And where we decided to send them in the moon South Pole. So all this looks amazing, but how we can do that? So in order to do that, we need some key elements. One of them is this rocket that you see here in the left side, which is called SLS. So this rocket is the huge, the biggest rocket ever built. And you know that after the shuttle flight, there were no other means by the US to go in space. So they were always using Russian, um, the Soyuz Russian to go uh, to space. Now with uh, SpaceX, we changed that. And so recently, very recently, last year, um, Elon Musk was able to send uh, astronaut from the US soil. Despite that, we want to have a, a much a bigger rocket with respect to the Falcon Heavy from SpaceX, and this is SLS. So we need a big rocket, then we need a, a, a place where the humans should stay, which is called Orion. So is this little thing that you see here up in the up uh, right corner. So this one is the uh, human module, which will be on the top of SLS, but after the rocket send it, shoot the Orion in, in outer space, Orion will go towards the moon. And then we need another thing, which is gateway. And you see here on the right, but in the bottom corner, the gateway is going to be similar to the International Space Station, but much smaller, and is going to orbit around the moon. So Orion, which you see here, is going to be, to be able to attach itself to the gateway module. What else do we need? We need a lunar landing system. So once we get to the gateway, we are able to orbiting around the moon, but how do we get to the moon's surface? So with the lunar landing system, we are going to have the capability from the gateway to get down and from the moon's surface to get up back on the gateway. So for doing this, we are going to use commercial partners. So what is different from when we went to the moon last time in the 60s and the 70s, this time we are going to have commercial partners and it's going to be also an international collaboration because the Lunar Gateway is going to be an international collaboration also with the Canadian 
space agency and also with the European Space Agency. So there's going to be lots of people, lots of partners participating. For the lunar landing system, we have three commercial partners, which are SpaceX, again, uh, Dynetics, and the national team, which is essentially Blue Origin. So we are going to have three different possibilities. And right now, NASA is uh, supporting all the three. So let's see better the steps to go to the moon. First of all, we want to go back to the moon, we said by 2024. How are we going to do that? So Artemis is going to be split in three missions. Artemis 1, which is going to do a launch test using LSS, LSS and Orion by 2021. Then we are by the end of 2021. So it's supposed to be November. Then Artemis 2, that about August of 2023, will get humans in orbit around the moon. So they will just go in orbit around the moon and come back just to see that everything is doable. And then in 2024, by then, the lunar gateway, the landing facility should be ready. So by 2024, we will get humans to the gateway and then to the lunar surface. This is the plan. But once we get to the, to the moon, can we say that if it's safe or not for humans to live on the moon or even on Mars? And so the real question, is the space empty? So the space, without the protection of the atmosphere, so as you know, the International Space Station, or you might not know, is 400 kilometers on the top of our surface of the ground, 400 kilometers. And we still have some residual atmosphere there. And we also have some residual of the Earth magnetic field. So there we have a sort of protection of shielding for the radiation. Not that much, but we still have a protection. It's not like outer space. But if we go to the moon, then it's going to be outer space. And without the protection of atmosphere, astronauts will need some type of shielding from the radiation. Because in space, we have lots of radiation. We know that between Apollo 16 and 17, there was a very strong solar event that would have caused acute radiation sickness. Likely, there were no astronauts at that time. But when we plan a long mission, we need to uh, take care of that. And we need to consider also this opportunity and possibility. What are the effects of radiation in the human body? So what you see here on the right is the DNA. What we have is that those particles, called radiation, when they cross through the, through the body, the human body, they can break the DNA. And then this can cause a lot of problems. So we can have lots of type of different disease that could happen. So that's why we need to protect our astronauts. So space is filled with radiation particles. And these radiation particles are known as cosmic rays. Do we know that cosmic rays exist? Cosmic rays, we are able to see them if we go to the North Poles, for example, or the South Poles, because there are auroras. <coughs> Sorry. So auroras, Borealis and Australis, that you probably, I hope some of you have seen in person. I never saw it and I would like, is in my bucket list. So auroras are essentially these trapped particles, so cosmic rays that get trapped in the magnetic field of our planet. And so we can see it closer to the polar regions. And so how can we measure cosmic rays? We have our instrument, the alpha magnetic spectrometer, and you see here a beautiful picture taken from space of our instrument which is able to perform the measurement of galactic cosmic rays. So AMS is located in, the, in this location here of the International Space Station. Is uh, seven tones and is five meters times four meters times three meters, which means 
a big instrument to be in space because you can imagine that every time you lift something in space, it's very, uh, it's extremely complicated to bring it up there, right? Because you need a lot of power. So this instrument was really uh, big considering that it was in space and it was brought up by this, the last flight of the shuttle. It's an international collaboration. So we have uh, 15 countries and 46 institutes from all over the world. You see here all the different places that are collaborating to build this instrument. And this instrument is made by a lot of different parts. So it's like a car. You have uh, lots of different parts and each of them, they do a different uh, thing and they serve a different purpose. Those are particle detectors, like the one used in accelerator to measure particles, but they have been miniaturized to work in space. So to give you an, an idea of the dimension, here you see AMS and you see two astronauts that are working very close to our instrument. It was installed on May 2011, and we have taken data since then, measuring over 160 billion particles. So what are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are charged particles composed of the same subatomic particles that make up all the matter on the Earth, on our planet. 79% are nuclei of hydrogen. And then we have 14%, which are helium, and 7% are heavier elements. Here you see a picture where it plots of our data where we measure all the different chemical elements. So you see hydrogen, helium, then you see CNO, which carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and so on, all the different elements. But where these cosmic rays come from? Do you have an idea? So you see there in the back, some hint of the progenitor of these cosmic rays. Cosmic rays, they come from very, very big stars, 10 times our sun, that at the end of their life, they explode in a beautiful, beautiful picture that the astronomers take. You see all these pictures? Those are called supernova remanents. So these stars, essentially, you have that the gravity is so big and so because they are so heavy that at the end of their life, they explode. And all these beautiful colors, they represent a different physical mechanism that is going on at that time. This is the end of the star, but it represents also a nursery of new stars because new stars will born from there. <coughs> so in this uh, explosion, many particles get accelerated. So this cosmic rays not only tells you about the space radiation that we need to protect, that astronauts need to be protected from. But they are also very important because they can give you information about all the matter existing in the universe. So they are very, very important for scientists because we can study all the constituent of matters. And what about our sun? Also our sun, and this you see a beautiful picture of our sun with the flare, which is this explosion that you see here, very bright. And the plasma, this plasma coming out, this is called coronal mass ejection. They are super big. Look at the relative size with our planet. Super big. Thank God we are so far away. So we, we, don't, need to, <laughs> we don't need to be scared about it. But you know, there are lots and lots of particles that get ejected during this big explosion that are occurring at our sun. And these particles then, once they get ejected, they, can, they, go, through, they go through space and they can reach our astronauts. So uh, thank God here on our planet, we have our magnetic field and the Earth magnetic field act as a shield and deflect most of the particles from the sun so that we don't get uh, disturbed. And it's in these cases where we see the auroras, right? So we just appreciate the beautiful auroras. But for astronauts, it could be a problem. So here, I just give you an idea. 
we say that we went in space in May 2011. And here you see till the end of 2018. This is the flux of the particles that we measure. And you see how it changes with time. It changes a lot. So it's not stable. The space radiation is not stable. And why is that? Because our sun, although when you look at it, it looks always the same, in the reality it has seasons. Yes, seasons like here. You see that we have uh, spring, summer, winter, and so on. The same is there. But the, the season for the summer are much, much longer. So where we see here this dip, in this dip, we have a very low radiation, the, the very low radiation. And this low radiation is due to the fact that the sun is very active. So why you have low radiation if the sun is very active? Because the sun is protecting us from all the particles that are coming from all the stars. So because the sun is protecting us because it's very active, we have very low radiation. And when the sun instead is, a, is a weak, not that active, and here you see with the red part, we have lots and lots of radiation coming. So you would imagine if I need to send my astronauts in space, I would probably send them when I have a very low radiation. So for example, in April, 2014, here when you have the blue region, right? So not that much radiation. But the thing is that the sun is very active. And because the sun is very active, then you might have a lot of explosion of solar energetic particles. So of the explosion from the sun, which are short in time, but still very intensive. So we can see that the flux, it changes also of 300% from 2013 to 2017. So it's very important to plan your mission to space in a very good way so that you can protect your astronauts. And another thing that I want to show you is how it changes, how the radiation varies. So we have the red means lots of particles, lots of radiation, and blue means not that much, not that many particles. And we see here for protons, which is like hydrogen, but we see it also for nuclei. So like iron, oxygen, very heavy elements. And you see how for both of them, we have lots of concentration, lots of red close to the polar regions, while not that much radiation in the equatorial region. And this is related to the protection of our uh, magnetic field. So we also measured during this time, 28 solar energetic particles from the sun, very, very strong events, which may have caused a problem to our astronaut. So how can astronauts survive for a long period of time in outer space? We need to be able to forecast when the radiation is going to be very low and tell them when we have solar energetic particles from the sun, they can get into sheltered areas. Like for example, you see here, this astronaut is, he can barely breathe because he has all these things around that which are dynamic shielding that get pop up with inside water, all sorts of things that we have to make an extra protection. But we also need to have sheltered areas on the moon. And here, for example, you see on the right, some possible um, moon village, um, a possible moon village where you see to the astronaut, go back to the house, to your moon house now, because you could have lots of space radiation coming. So at the University of Hawaii, where I work with my team, we are essentially providing all this information that you saw before about the space radiation to NASA so that they are able to um, adjust their models to be able to predict when is the best time to have what is called extravehicular activity. So to send out our astronaut from the space, uh, spacecraft on from the, their location. And also how they could improve their shielding with the spacesuit and new spacecraft. 
So all these things were presented also to the White House in February 6, 2020, because this uh, is part of the National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan. <clears throat> so we have results, some results that are um, accurate measurement for all cosmic radiation from AMS. This data is providing new information to advanced models employed to predict the radiation dose absorbed by astronauts during long uh, duration mission to the moon. And you have to think that all the technologies in, in space are part of our everyday life. So we have all satellites for communication, right? We are always with our mobile phone. We have GPS, otherwise we don't know how to go in the complicated roads in Rome. And all the timestamps in the GPS are used constantly. So also when we use our credit card, we need a timestamp from the GPS to be able to identify the real, the, the cost of that transaction. So that's why it's so important the study of space weather, because to be able to for forecast is crucial to extend the, the lifetime of our assets in space. And right now, orbiting around our planet, there are kind of uh, 20,000 uh, satellites. So if you want to know more about uh, our research and what we do, you can uh, log into this website and you are going to have more information. I want to give you some other final remarks. The discovery requires technical solutions that do not ex yet exist, embracing multidisciplinary aspects, physics, engineering, architecture, but also agriculture or medicine and many other way things in, cooper in a cooperative way. Science is nourished by creativity that is particularly necessary to overcome challenges. And often the solution find application that are different from the original purpose. And this results in human advancement. And then people all over the world are working together to face these challenges to be able for long space travel. And this is the end of my presentation about uh, what I'm doing. Uh, but I was asked also to, to give a, a short presentation about my story. Amore, mi porti un bicchiere d'acqua, per favore. Grazie. So I'm from, where I'm from? I'm from Toscany, a very small village in Montamiata, Italy. So you see a beautiful mountain here, and it's here in the middle of Italy. So a bit, two hours north from Rome. None in my family was into science. And you see here with my father, with me saying, I want to be an astronaut. So I didn't manage to become an astronaut, but as you see, I work every day, daily with astronauts. I met so many of them and uh, I mean, I achieved more than I ever think that I could do in my life. So I hope that uh, telling you about my story, I can inspire you because you can do much better than I did. So in my family, they, are, they were all that workers and they believed in me and they helped me find my, my purpose and they supported my choice. I graduated from the University of Bologna in astronomy and then I got my PhD in physics. And here you see myself with all my family or everybody was very happy. And then what? You think, okay, now I graduated, so now is everything is good. No, then it's not easy. You, re you realize that difficulties make you doubt many times about your choice. It happened to me and it will happen to you too. So you'll see that many times you will think, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? Did I take the right path? And and also in my case, for example, something that I hope it will not happen to you, I found less and less women along my career. And so it's complicated, whatever decision you take in life, whatever you want to become in life is becoming very complicated when you do unusual uh, decision. 
So like when I say to my parents, I want to become an astronaut or I want to study astronomy, they were like, oh, and what are you going to do then? What are you going to work on? So it was always very competitive, but you don't need to give up. So it's important to have links and connection with people that believe in you. And there are people that believe in you. And there are people similar to you that in love the same thing you love. So you need to have important role models. And uh, role models could be people in your family. In my case, there were people in my family. I had some what I call cool professors that inspired me. And sometimes I had friends that they were much better than me and I was inspired by them. Or you can find people in history books or wherever. So different role models inspired me in my career. And inspiration, I think, is necessary because you need to leave your comfort zone. Every time you feel yourself like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Well, then is the time you are leaving your comfort zone. And when you do that, you learn something. Even if it doesn't go as planned, you are still learning something. And then what else? Yeah, it's, it's important to have mentors. So the mentors, why are important? Because you need to ask around, ask, ask questions. Then you will. the ultimate decision will be always yours but it's crucial to get different perspectives in life, always important. And then with the first successes, you get more confident about yourself, your capabilities. Here you see myself in NASA, in Cape Canaveral, in Houston, describing our instrument to the NASA administrator of that time. So lots of success and then you feel, okay, I made it, but still, in your life, you always have to address balance of work and family, expectations and confidence, fear. You need to set your priorities. So it's all the time. It's not easy. But sharing your difficulties with people that have or have similar struggle will definitely help you to find better solutions. So my personal mantra is shoot for the moon because no matter if you miss it, you will be among the stars. So you need to give it a try and then you'll see how it goes, <laughs> right? And so I want to finish with this last slide, uh, which I shows myself. I'm in the middle with my students because I'm, I'm enjoying very much doing research, but I'm also having a lot of fun with my students. And I love my job. So although I didn't become an astronaut, I'm super happy anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much.